Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to, to our first Human Rights Centre speaker series of this new year and this spring term. Um, I'm delighted to be able to, to present to you in, in due course uh, our speaker for today, who probably doesn't need too much introduction to many of you, but may need some introduction to some of you. So I'm going to introduce our speaker. I'll then speak very briefly about the, the subject of Professor Moyne's talk today. Professor Moyne will then speak for about 40 minutes or so, which will give us a sufficient time, significant time for a Q&A. Uh, as is the usual kind of protocol with, with Zoom webinars, if you could please place your questions into the Q&A box. Um, I will do my utmost best to try and um, place all of them, present all of them to our speaker. Um, apologies if I'm unable to get to all of them um, ahead, of, ahead of time, but uh, we'll, we'll do our very best. Okay, so. Professor Samuel Moyne is Chancellor Kent Professor of Law and History at Yale University. He's written several books in his fields of European intellectual history and human rights history, including The Last Utopia, Human Rights in History, and edited or co-edited a number of others. His most recent books are Christian Human Rights 2015, based on Mellon Distinguished Lectures at the University of Pennsylvania in the autumn of 2014, and a book that I'm sure many of you are very familiar with, Not Enough, Human Rights in an Unequal World, uh, published in 2018. His newest book is a slight departure from, from his focus upon human rights, but nevertheless takes a, a, critical, a, a critical perspective upon another crucial area uh, of social justice, which is humane, how the United States abandoned peace and reinvented war. Professor Moyne will be speaking to his book today, and I'll give you a brief uh, precy of that now. Inhumane, How the United States Abandoned Peace and Reinvented War, Samuel Moyne asks a troubling but urgent question. What if efforts to make war more ethical, to ban torture and limit civilian casualties have only shored up the military enterprise and made it sturdier? To advance this case, Samuel Moyne looks back at a century and a half of passionate arguments about the ethics of using force. In the 19th century, the founders of the Red Cross struggled mightily to make war less lethal, even as they acknowledged its inevitability. Leo Tolstoy prominently opposed their efforts, reasoning that war needed to be abolished, not reformed. And over the subsequent century, a popular movement to abolish war flourished on both sides of the Atlantic. Eventually, however, reformers shifted their attention from opposing the crime of war to opposing war crimes with fateful consequences. Humane examines how America went off to fight and never came back, and the transformation of armed combat from an imperfect tool for resolving disputes into an integral component of the modern condition. As American wars have become more humane, they have also become endless. This provocative book, and today's no doubt provocative presentation and talk, argues that this development might not represent progress at all. Sam, Professor Moyne, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Andrew, very much for the invitation. Uh, and it's very nice to, to be back involved with the, the center. And I will, you know, substantiate and spell out the summary uh, you've just given and uh, reserve time for uh, engagement, you know, which it should be ferocious. Uh, with the audience. So I'll show some slides and uh, we'll begin. So uh, this book was really inspired by my experience as an American uh, and provoked in particular by an extraordinary moment when the then president of the United States in the fall of 2009 was first awarded the Nobel Peace Prize and then flew to Oslo to give an, a speech accepting it. Uh, you will all remember, uh, even if you're young, what magic Barack Obama's election really was, not just for Americans uh, at a more optimistic time, uh, but for the whole world, signified by his almost immediate uh, uh, win in this competition for the uh, prize for peace. Uh, 
in, in early fall, it was a shock. I remember waking up as he did on the East Coast and turning on those, you know, inventions we used to have television. And Barack Obama came down from the White House residence, shocked as everyone else by the news. He had much younger daughters at that time. He had a new dog all of which he commented was helping him keep his even greater global superstardom in perspective. He actually said he didn't deserve the prize that morning. He commented that he hadn't done anything yet. Uh, actually, as, as we'll see in the course of this lecture, he'd done quite a lot. He'd reinvented the war on terror as it stood uh, on the day he took office in January. 2009. Even more arresting was the speech he gave uh, uh, two months later in December 2009, receiving the prize. Once he asked if he had to appear to receive it and was told that he did, uh, he disclaimed uh, the predecessor. He often liked to um, to cite in other settings. That was Martin Luther King Jr. who had won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1964. After all, Obama said, King, a pacifist, uh, an advocate of peace had never had the responsibility of leading world history's greatest armed superpower. And you just don't have that much weaponry if you're not going to leave open the possibility of using it sometimes. Uh, and so if he was a Peace Prize president, he was one who defended the, the occasional necessity of war, especially American war, uh, which makes the world a better place, he said. But there was a saving grace, uh, he finished. What distinguished American war, what made it exceptional in the annals was that it could become humane. And amazingly, while disclaiming Martin Luther King in this moment, he uh, remembered that the very first recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize, co-recipient in 1901, had been an advocate of the humanization of warfare. That was Swiss gentleman, Henri Dunant. Uh, and that's the legacy that Obama claimed. Now, I was, uh, as I said, provoked by this speech. Uh, I knew who Dunant was, but it was nonetheless striking that this was the first president uh, who had ever name-checked uh, this obscure Swiss founder of what became the International Red Cross, let alone gave so much attention to the moral importance of the project for which Dunant stood, which was the attempt not to end war, but to make it less brutal. And so I wanted to know how could that be have become possible? Uh, what were its the origins of that project in the 19th century and how did it happen that Barack Obama uh, could uh, cite it as his version of peace, not actual peace, but a, a more humane form of war. And that's what the book uh, is about. So in my time, I'll, I will look back at that er early period and actually spend most of my minutes uh, there because I found in my research that the whole idea of making war more humane was more contested at the start than it is now, in particular by Russian novelist and Count Leo Tolstoy. Then I'll explain how Tolstoy's fears about Dunant's project were premature, uh, but have become more relevant in our time, especially to the uh, version of the war on terror that in his first year in office, Obama uh, pioneered. And then I'll try to draw some lessons. So Tolstoy, as you know, is uh, most famous as a writer. 
Um, and yet in the later 19th century, he was equally, if not more renowned as a, a moralist, a pacifist and vegetarian. Uh, and yet it was before that period in you know, what's generally taken to be his, his most famous novel, War and Peace, that Tolstoy first expresses some doubts, uh, or at least one of his two main protagonists, Prince Andrei, does about the humanization of warfare. Prince Andrei says this is the night before the great battle and the Napoleonic campaign uh, that the novel narrates of Borodino, where actually Prince Andre is going to be mortally wounded. Prince Andre remarks, they talk of the laws of warfare and humanity to the wounded and so on. It's all rubbish. Now, this is interesting, uh, and I can't absolutely validate this claim, but it's possible, uh, and I think likely, that this was a commentary on Henri Dunant and his project of the Geneva Convention of 1864, uh, which was the first international treaty to regulate warfare and to do so by imposing humane constraints on it, in particular by allowing for the treatment of the wounded by neutral parties like Swiss do-gooders. Uh, it's the reason why Dunant, 35 years later, won the Nobel Pre Peace Prize. And it seems likely to me, though again, I can't prove it, that, uh, that Tolstoy is having his character dismiss it. And you might wonder why. How could such a project uh, of making war less brutal for those involved, first soldiers, eventually in our day, civilians, have anything objectionable about it. Uh, and, uh, and yet uh, Tolstoy has his character continue and provide an answer to that question. And he says the following, leaving war brutal would paradoxically make warfare less cruel. If there were none of this playing at generosity in warfare, we'd never go to war except some, for something worth facing certain death for. Now, I think it, this claim is, is mistaken, but we should dwell on it for a minute. Um, one interesting feature of it is that it, it is actually on common ground with Dunant in saying the problem we are trying to solve is the reduction of cruelty. And then there's a debate about whether leaving war brutal or making its conduct uh, more humane will lead to less cruelty. And then we're in a kind of empirical debate because Andre makes an empirical conjecture, let's call it that, uh, in current terminology, that if war were left less brutal, there would be fewer wars uh, because people wouldn't go as readily, wouldn't order them, wouldn't participate in them. Now, this is an empirical conjecture. It wasn't the only such empirical conjecture in the 19th century. Uh, uh, Karl von Clausewitz, who actually, uh, this German theorist of war, uh, who actually Tolstoy has march across the battlefield right before Andrei gives his speech, had conjectured himself that leaving war brutal will make it shorter uh, because it will be so nasty that there will be greater incentive to end it sooner. And the first author of a national code of the laws of war before the international treaty of the Geneva Convention, a Prussian American named Franz or Francis Lieber said the same thing. And his code allows a lot of brutality on the supposition that it will allow for shorter wars. Regardless, these 19th century skeptics of humanizing war are doing guesswork. Uh, and I think we should doubt the guesses they're making. 
uh, it's an interesting uh, thesis, but it's one that seems not to have lots of confirmation in world history since. We can think of a lot of brutal wars that don't seem to deter future wars. And we can think of a lot of brutal wars that go on and on. So the idea that leaving war the way it is or even allowing brutality to be increased in it would lead to more peace and therefore less cruelty seems dubious in the extreme. Now, fortunately, I think uh, Prince Andres, let's say crude argument, uh, allows for some improvement. And Tolstoy in his later career, the period on which I dwell in the book of his pacifism uh, after his Christian conversion, about a decade after War and Peace, uh, stage that improvement. Prince Andre's argument is about the allegedly beneficent effects of something bad, brutality. But what if we focused on the paradoxical or perverse effects of humanizing war? Uh, it's a good thing to do so. It makes the world a better place, but it could involve some risks. It's a more modest claim. I think one that is much more plausible and it's one we should think about uh, and look at how Tolstoy in particular, the later Tolstoy developed it. The more careful and modest, I think more plausible version of the claim is that uh, while a good thing, uh, while making the world a better place from some perspectives, humanizing war could allow for its facilitation or make the legitimation of it especially over long periods of time, easier than otherwise. Uh, now, this also requires an empirical conjecture. Um, to me, it's a more plausible one. Um, and uh, it also requires some story about like the pathways by which the risk of, let's call it, humane uh, facilitation or legitimation could come to pass. And I want to focus for a few minutes on how Tolstoy, I think, pioneeringly, pioneeringly dwelled on those pathways through two analogies that he proposed for thinking about the humanization of war in his later career. He thought about the uh, character of the advocate or reformist who wants to humanize war. And then he thought about the character of the audience member or beneficiary of more humanized violence and tried to think about uh, the risks that those particular characters incur in their relationship to more humanized war. Now, before I you know report on what Tolstoy said, I just want to be clear, all he can modestly claim is that there are these risks um, in humanizing uh, violent corporal practices. And if there's a risk, it doesn't mean it's always incurred in every war or every time something's humanized. And even if it is incurred, it doesn't imply that we should just not bother with humanitarianism. It does imply that there are risks to control and manage. So what were the comparisons? Uh, he, Tolstoy attempted to, one with chattel slavery in his past uh, and the other with non-human animal slaughter in his and our present. And again, he's looking at these characters uh, and the way in which they could be involved in the um, in running the risk, maybe even incurring the risk of humane facilitation and legitimation of war. So the first comparison is with chattel slavery and Tolstoy's past. And he says, for most of legal history before uh, events like the civil war in my country or the Tsar's abolition of serfdom around the same time in Tolstoy's country, the main legal project of reform was the humanization of slavery. In the British empire, your empire and in the early legal history of my country, it was it was termed amelioration. Uh, 
a body of law and policy that would place humanizing constraints on what slavers could do with and to their human property. Uh, and this was a reform strategy. Uh, it seems as if uh, it uh, could maybe did run the risk of entrenching slavery. One historian you see on the slide says, that's what happened. And it, it shouldn't surprise us, even in our day when you talk to death penalty reformers, they, they face an ever-present dilemma. If they attack the cruelty with which death is imposed on convicts, they make the very practice of the death penalty less controversial, at least to some people. And the question for Tolstoy is whether the same could happen since it did with slavery, with the humanization of war. Now, this case is, let's say, narrowly focused on the reformer. And Tolstoy's agenda here, as I try to detail in the book, is looking at the compromise that the advocate or reformer makes. So let's call this the theory of the advocate's compromise. Uh, because what does the advocate do? He or she concludes, maybe rightly, that abolition is uh, not possible yet, or maybe thinks that humane slavery is uh, not just a necessity, but uh, a good thing. And so the reformer compromises with the slaver, says, I will help you strengthen your property right if you agree to treat your property less harshly, thereby making your ownership less controversial. So it's like a deal that's made uh, ac across the line between the reformer and the, the target of his reform. And Tolstoy's basic argument is that this is an a, an ethically dreadful compromise. Uh, uh, and his, his claim is that it was a mistake to humanize slavery. Uh, it involved reformers in particular in ethical compromises that were unholy because slavery, we now know, could have been abolished. It was abolished, at least in, in, in its in legalized forms. Okay, so that's the first argument. The second argument is about a very different group of people, the audience or the beneficiary of humanized violence. Uh, I mentioned that Tolstoy was, was a pacifist and a vegetarian. He was actually the most famous vegetarian of his uh, era, but already in War and Peace when he's still eating meat, he has Prince Andre say that humanizing war is like uh, the magnanimity of the lady who turns sick at the sight of a slaughtered calf. She can't stand the violence perpetrated for her sake or in her name. But if it's less outrageous to her, she will eat the meat with a very good appetite. Now, several decades later, um, Tolstoy visited in you know, a big town near his aristocratic estate, one of the new slaughterhouses kind of sweeping the transatlantic space that are uh, built to be more humane to animals. Uh, and Tolstoy writes a reflection on his visit. He's let in, he sees everything. And it, it, it's the preface to an early animal rights treatise. Uh, and he uses the same an analogy it's a gendered analogy, which we can talk about if you want. He says, imagine a lady who can't stand that there's cruelty for her sake or in her name, uh, but she still eats the animals. Uh, and the fact is that once she believes or knows that the violence for her is more humane now, she will 
eat the animals with full assurance that she's doing right. Now, let's call this kind of argument the beneficiary's bad faith. It's different than the advocate's compromise because it's about the audience or beneficiary of violence. And the basic idea is that if we're told that the violence uh, that is done by our leaders allegedly for our protection is done humanely, we'll own, we won't ask hard questions about uh, whether it's moral in the first place. We might even take the humanization of the violence as falsely as a guarantee that we're still good people. And so my suggestion is that both of these analogies that Tolstoy develops and that I you know, spell out in the early parts of the book are, are about how it could happen that the risk of humane facilitation and legitimation of war could take place. Whether it does in any given instance is another matter. But he's trying to show that it's very plausible that because of the compromises that advocates make and the bad faith in which beneficiaries engage, humanization could have these very regrettable effects. Well, before leaving the 19th century, let's, in fairness, look at what the Red Cross said about Tolstoy's sort of argument, pacifist doubts about the validity of humanizing war. Actually, Dunant was expelled very quickly from the Swiss project, and another man, Gustave Moignier, uh, took charge for decades. Uh, he probably should have won the Nobel Prize. He worked harder for a longer time on humaniz humanizing war. And at a certain point in a speech before funders, he says, no, it's the opposite of what Tolstoy says. Actually, my empirical conjecture is that humanizing war will bring about peace. Uh, now, uh, he says the humanization of war could only end in its abolition. And his causal pathway is as follows. If you and I are shooting at one another across a battlefield, and there are constraints placed on us that, in a sense, require us to see that the enemy is a human being, slowly, it will dawn on us that killing human beings uh, is monstrous and it shouldn't happen and peace will uh, follow. Well, you know, we could get into interesting debates about whether this can ever happen. Let's, it's a sequencing view of how humanity uh, and peace uh, are, are like a stepping stone, have a, a, a relation that one is a stepping stone to the other. We could even look back to Tolstoy's first analogy and ask, well, did humanizing slavery allow for the crystallization of abolitionist sentiment? Doubtful, but it's possible. We could ask, does the humanization of non-human animal slaughter lead to more or less meat eating? Well, Gustave Moignier might hypothesize that it leads to more vegetarianism. Seems like that's a mis mistake empirically. Uh, humane slaughter has led to the acceleration of meat eating. But point is, Moignier, you know, was was himself on the same terrain as Tolstoy, making an empirical conjecture. I think it's false. Uh, I think just as Prince Andre's conjecture is sounds pretty dubious. It doesn't seem correct, given what happened in the 20th century, that uh, at least the early attempts to make war humane decrease the incidence of war uh, at, at all. Uh, maybe other things did, but not humanization. Um, very interestingly, Moignier claimed at a certain point uh, that if it ever happened, that someone proved to him that the laws of war, making war less brutal, actually perpetuated war, he would quit the Red Cross. Uh, now, I wonder if he would, uh, if I could resurrect him 
and get him to listen to this lecture? Probably not, because I think we're in the earliest days of thinking about this risk. And maybe it's not incurred often enough that he would change his mind. But it's amazing that Moinier said, I would grant Tolstoy's position if it, it were empirically validated by our experience. And then the question is, has that happened yet? Okay, well, I want to suggest very quickly before moving to close that it didn't happen in Tolstoy's lifetime. You know, like many prophets, he was way premature for a few reasons. One is that after 1864, most of the laws of war are not about humanizing war at all. They're about military necessity and about allowing militaries who are negotiating all the successor treaties uh, to maximize force. Second, most global war for the longest time uh, is in colonial circumstances within empires, which the international laws of war don't govern, or at the borders of empire when the laws of war were just bracketed. Uh, and so another way of putting this is to say for the longest time, the laws of war were very openly racialized in their application. And so any humanity they included was uh, very explicitly for the sake of intra-Christian and intra-white warfare. And therefore, most global war, no one wants it to be humane. And so there's no worry of Tolstoy's sort about whether it, 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 we're facing this risk uh, of, uh, of entrenched, entrenching warfare through humanizing it. Third and finally, even within the North Atlantic space, uh, especially in World War I and II, it just turns out to be the case that these laws are very weak. They're set aside very quickly, especially in existential warfare, uh, when, uh, even when Christians and whites are fighting one another. Um, and so if there's no serious regime, then there's no uh, reason to worry that it might uh, le le facilitate or legitimate war lead to its perpetuation. As you see on on the slide, some people like H.G. Wells worried, uh, expressed Tolstoy's worry, uh, but I think it was just way too early because there's just too much brutality to believe that humanity is playing the role of uh, that Tolstoy uh, foresaw. The question is what happened in our time? In our time, I think some big events happened. Uh, in the last 50 years, the laws of war have finally been humanized in their content. There were some early um, steps for the sake of prisoners of war, uh, even before this period. But since in the 20th century, aerial bombardment of civilian populations became such a mainstay of war, European and American war. Um, in my sense, the real step forward came in the 1970s in documents uh, called the, Inter the Additional Protocols to the Geneva Conventions, and especially two more or less new rules that those documents contain. One is the first clear commitment to a principle of distinction between shooting at combatants and shooting at non-combatants. It's the first time that the law says very clearly that you cannot shoot at non-combatants. And then since you can kill non-combatants collaterally, there's a second principle, the proportionality principle, which says roughly that you can't kill too many in pursuing legitimate uh, military advantage. And both of these two principles, really alone, but also in combination, forbid the kinds of warfare that had prevailed in the 20th century before. Um, to an extent, uh, in addition, this is the period of the deracialization, very partial deracialization of international law. Um, and uh, 
I think there are a few really clear reasons why this departure happened about 50 years ago. The main reason is the decolonization of the world, where uh, all those peoples, non-Christian and non-white, who'd borne the brunt of brutal European warfare for centuries, got a voice in the content of the law. And while their main goal was to uh, make peace uh, more of a priority, even than the UN Charter of 1945 had made it, the new states of the post-colonial world made the humanization of war a genuine concern. Second, West European states like yours gave up empire, uh, you know, not always willingly or without a fight. And at that point, it was easy for West Europeans to consent to the humanization of wars. They weren't fighting anymore, certainly not the kinds they'd fought uh, for centuries. I think the interesting case is the American case. Since West Europeans relied on my country to fight the wars they'd been fighting for centuries uh, around the world, and I, I, I pay a lot of attention to um, America's Pacific Wars against Japan in World War II in Korea, which was really an, the most extraordinary, extraordinarily brutal war uh, uh, of America's 20th century. Uh, and then, of course, in Vietnam. And that's a pivotal war, that last one, because a new kind of humanitarian arises in its aftermath, not one contesting the justice or legality of going to war, that had been the role of the anti-war movement, which rose and fell finally after the Vietnam War, but uh, of how states fight, uh, how they conduct their hostilities. As an example, Human Rights Watch, the storied NGO, is neutral on the justice or legality of wars, uh, but has committed to monitoring whether both sides violate the laws of, of the conduct of hostilities of war, including the additional protocols of the Geneva Convention. And in the same time period, the United States military adopted new constraints, humane constraints in the now humanized law of war, largely because uh, at least some in the US military recognized that they suffered a grievous public relations blow in, uh, due to the My Lai massacre in the Vietnam War. And they took the humanitarian cause seriously in the same way that slavers had two centuries before. And advocates were, in a sense, helping the military uh, from the outside of government um, uh, and, uh, to, in a sense, strengthen its the morality of its war making by demanding that the military clean it up, which the military to a striking extent was willing to do. Um, and so that sets the stage uh, just in a few minutes of conclusion for our time, our most recent period of, of the war on terror, because there were really two such wars. Uh, uh, if we did a very basic military history of the war on terror, we would say that George W. Bush declared war, heavy footprint war, with lots of troops in two places, Afghanistan first and then Iraq. Uh, that form of war actually became controversial pretty quickly, uh, and he began to pivot beyond it. Uh, but then Barack Obama came to power. He had run as a peace candidate, but what he actually did, including in that first year in office, was to reinvent the war on terror, to move it decisively uh, in a no footprint and light footprint direction. No footprint, meaning uh, no troops at all involved, thanks to the heavy reliance on armed drones and other standoff uh, missile technologies. No footprint. This sorry, light footprint. This is less, I think, studied and understood. The extraordinary turn by my country's uh, leaders to special forces, small teams of men who visit and kill, and the infrastructure for both of these forms of warfare, light and no footprint, expanded massively uh, under Obama's presidency with a drone empire 
you know, being built deep into sub-Saharan Africa. And by 2016, when Obama left office, U.S. special forces setting foot in 70% of the countries of the world that reached 80% under Donald Trump. What I need to focus on to conclude is how this second form, the light and no footprint form of the world war on terror was humanized rhetorically and really because now I think we should take Tolstoy's premature anxiety and prophecy seriously. Uh, first, there was the period in which the first form of the war on terror was delegitimated, not for its illegality as such, but because it involved illegal and immoral torture. Uh, that was especially in domestic political debate in the United States, the absolutely central theme of agitation around the war on terror in roughly 2004 through 2006. And Barack Obama understood this. Uh, and that's why when he uh, assumed power in 2009, he, if you like, uh, removed the bug of inhumanity, torture, leading the way from the program of endless war. That was his goal, and he achieved it. Uh, and that's why that first period in Obama's administration is so pivotal. Even as he won the Nobel Peace Prize, he was reinventing the war on terror in a humanizing direction. Now, uh, he said so, as I mentioned in starting this talk in his Nobel address, uh, very clearly, American exceptionalism now resides in following the Geneva Convention while continuing the struggle against terrorism. Uh, and then more remarkably, he uh, said so four years later in an address at the National Defense University, once the drone program was, you know, became known in part through selective leaks by his own administration. That day he gave a talk about new guidelines he was imposing on targeted killings, which had previously been viewed as an illegal practice in the international system. He said, it's a necessity for good, but we will make sure that it's humane. Uh, he was heckled by an anti-war uh, activist. And amazingly, in this speech, Obama said, I know endless war is bad for empires. Think about Rome. Uh, and the degradation of liberty and the fall of its empire. But the point of the speech was to entrench endless war in a new humane form. It's remarkable that the guidelines he imposed and which were kept by Donald Trump go further than the requirements of the laws of war, uh, which, as I mentioned, allow for some civilian killing uh, uh, if it's kept proportional or not disproportionate to uh, military advantage. Obama required that strikes to be undertaken can risk no civilian harm foreseeably. Now, I think we could respond that that rule wasn't followed, and it wasn't. But it's amazing that Obama imposed it on America's continuing practice of targeted killing. So my thesis in brief is that Tolstoy has been proved right in our time. And if that's true, then we would need to be careful, more careful than we have been about focusing solely on the humanization of war as if it didn't have these risks uh, that we should control and manage. In my sense, we w should learn from the war on terror that we should never separate our concern about how war is fought from you know, bigger concerns about whether it takes place uh, at all. And I think uh, we're in a moment, uh, thanks to Vladimir Putin, when actually we're getting more and more concerned about the illegal initiation of force and not just caught up as we have been for decades in a narrower debate about what it would take to make the conduct of war ethical and humane.
So I'll stop there uh, and uh, thank you very much and uh, face uh, whatever music you'd like to play. Sam, thank you so much. Um, thank you also for the uh, slightly unexpected uh, tweet from Donald Trump. <laughs> I can see the relevance, but, uh, but thank you so much. Thank you for such a, such a rich, such a thought provoking, such a, a multi-layered um, presentation. I have a, I have a million uh, thoughts running through my head. I'm just going to kind of share some of them with you, not in any way an expectation of a question. I will put a question to you uh, in due course, but I mean, as a, as a philosopher, there's clearly, uh, as I am, there are many kind of dimensions to your project. So as some obvious questions would be, how do you feel about the, the principle of lesser, e lesser evil? Um, what would a, a sort of genuine form of humanitarianism or normative humanitarianism look like uh, in accordance with, with your critique? Um, how, and then with a, my kind of critical theory hat on, wondering whether you have sympathies with the, the orthodox Marxist position on the welfare state uh, as, you know, having sort of ultimately delayed uh, or, or in, perpetually delayed the revolution by just alleviating the suffering of the, uh, of the proletariat. I mean, there, there are so many layers and so many dimensions to, to your project. Um, not expecting answers to, to any of those questions. I do, however, and I suppose for the, the benefit of the audience who uh, obviously I'm inviting to, to set their own questions on their own behalf, but really interested to, to know what took you to this theme. Um, so the kind of beginnings, as it were, the motivations, and then looking at slightly further down the field, down the lane, where you think it will lead uh, in terms of your, your engagement and your reception from within the humanitarian field, both sort of academic humanitarian field and the, and the practitioner humanitarian field. So if we draw parallels with or comparisons with, with your work on human rights, um, I mean, there are clear similarities, right? There are clear formal similarities, it seems to me, in terms of taking a set of, of narratives, discourses and institutions that make certain claims explicitly on their behalf or where claims are made in their behalf, on their behalf as, as being sufficient for, for addressing some of the grossest forms of social injustice. Uh, and your work has shown, actually, that's, that's not the case. Uh, we need to, to question again, the sort of complacency and, and the assumptions that we make about the capacity of, of some of these norms and institutions to genuinely address human suffering. Um, and you seem to be doing something similar in respect of, of humanitarianism. Uh, and the laws of armed conflict. So really keen to, to learn a bit more about what brought you to this, this field uh, and where you think it may go uh, in due course. And then inviting obviously the, the audience to, uh, to raise their questions through the Q&A. So yes, yeah, Sam, really keen to hear, hear more. All right, well, those are, those are uh, you know, uh, those are great questions and I'll try to answer them. Maybe I'll, I'll you know, address the two May you know, kind of groups of questions in reverse order. So, you know, I, you know, how did I come to write this? I think it's, there's a long story and a short story. You know, one, the longer story is that um, I, you know, took the, a class called the laws of war in uh, law school right before the war on terror began. And uh, the professor who's very well known and I, whom I admire and like, you know, assured us that there was a revolution afoot, that the, the, the um, laws of war were being humanized in our time. Um, and actually, I didn't mention this in the lecture, but they, they had been rebranded as so-called international humanitarian law in the 1960s and 1970s by a kind of successor in the first instance of Henri Dunant and Gustave Moynier. Um, but it had that rebranding had taken the field by storm. Even people in the military refer to the laws of war as IHL now. And in the 90s, in part because of some of the you know, tribunals, uh, especially the ad hoc tribunal in Yugoslavia, it was credible to claim that the IHL was being humanized. And so I was exposed to this claim a long time ago. And uh, yet it was only my experience of the of the Obama presidency, which was a you know full 10 years later, um, 
that really led me to write the book. I mean, I had, I did worry um, in the course of, of George W. Bush's presidency, eight years, um, why Americans were so narrowly, uh, let's say, obsessed by torture uh, in the war on terror. Because just by comparison, the at least the Iraq part, war part of the war on terror was extremely controversial, including in the United Kingdom. Uh, take the Chilcot report, which, you know, while not bearing on, you know, the illegality of it, uh, at least, you know, marked how salient the, the, the war itself could be in, in some places, especially Western Europe, um, or at least the Iraq war. Um, and, you know, we could even think of the broader war on terror, be because when Edward Snowden revealed what he revealed, Western Europeans got quite upset about new forms of surveillance that the war on terror brought. The trouble is, of course, that West Europeans, after notably after the Bataclan uh, incident, embraced you know the American surveillance state, um, notwithstanding the fact that it, you know, we don't have human rights, and you have a European human rights regime, which posed a some problems for that transformation. So uh, it, 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 it was troubling to me that Americans in particular were so focused on torture. And then Obama came and I thought we'd, he had been given a gift by the mode of agitation against the early war on terror because he could humanize the war. And it, 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 it is only fair to say that he did so. Um, and it, it, instead of just being a smokescreen for the perpetuation of war, the war was changed in its prosecution. Uh, uh, and then we can get into like really interesting debates about, you know, what the laws of war for, forbid and what our morality selectively um, forbids. I mean, it's very unclear to me even now, you're the philosopher, why torture is such a taboo uh, when Obama responded to the kind of political difficulties attendant on detaining suspects by just killing them. So, so this was really, I mean, at, at my outrage, honestly, at, at what happened to the war on terror uh, when it was made uh, normal or, or in the words of one great critic named Spencer Ackerman, a sustainable war is really at the root of this. And of course, I, I, I was interested not just in decision makers, um, but in the way that th their, their activity gets moralized enough in public debate uh, to create legitimacy. Hence my focus on reformers and, and on on beneficiaries. So that's sort of the origin story. I mean, a, a more uh, you know, boring thing to say uh, is that I was looking for an exit from what I had been doing and you know, stepping from human rights to humanitarian law seemed a, a modest step that would allow a, a more full-blown departure from, you know, uh, the kind of rut I felt I had gotten into in writing so much about human rights. So um, that's the kind of, that's how I came to write the book. Then then I, I kind of come to your your first set of questions. So I, I appreciate the resemblance of this argument to the old contrast of reform and revolution. Um, I am not proposing revolution, never have. Uh, so this is about comparative modes of reform. And the big contrast I'm interested in in this book and talk is between reformism that is unambitious and ambitious. In that regard, it's the same argument in as in not enough where I honor a commitment to a certain mode of reform, but wonder 
about why it's not ambitiously taking another seriously. In the former case, sufficient provision versus distributive equality. In this, the humanization of war relative to this, the fight for a, you know, a more peaceful interstate order. So the, even the ambitious uh, pull in those contrasts is not revolutionary. Um, it is about compromise and the the risk potentially that um, that unambitious schemes can run in legitimation. Even there, I think I'm much tougher on the laws of war. I mean, I don't believe I've ever claimed that human rights law actively participated in forestalling more ambitious politics. The, the goal was just to note uh, that they were unambitious relative to other things we could also be doing. In this book, I am making a kind of, you know, complicity argument. Uh, and the, the claim has to be that in certain cases, there's a, there's a causal implication of the humanizing agenda in the perpetuation of war. Uh, because otherwise there, the argument wouldn't make sense. And I think the causal claim is justified, although it's very hard to, you know, when you make that kind of claim to convince everyone um, what kind of proof would it take, et cetera, et cetera. On lesser evil, um, you know, philosophically, I have, I, first of all, I'm not a pacifist. And I also acknowledge that if there's a real situation where, uh, you know, there's just a choice of evils, we should choose the lesser one. I mean, I, I have no problem with that form of argument. Um, I, I, I really, my, my, I think my, my claim is, is, let's say, empirical, that that situation, it turns out to be much rarer than we might think. And that if that's true, then the lesser evil type of approach to these situation becomes a kind of um, moral escapism. The, 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 the suggestion would be that, well, actually, there are some wars that are, are not just worth not having, but that we could keep them from happening or shorten them once they start. That's, that's within the realm of empirical possibility. And we know that because after Obama ran as a peace candidate and became an endless war candidate. Trump won. And he himself ran as a kind of strange peace candidate. And interestingly, he did end some wars. Uh, uh, and uh, Biden, Joe Biden, kind of finished the job in Afghanistan that that Trump had had started really by withdrawing far, far more troops from there than uh, Biden did. Uh, in the end. So at, at, at least I think it's possible if by revisiting the history of peace agitation and cases in which it's just proven too difficult, very rare for politicians to legitimate new wars or perpetuated wars, that, um, that peace has a chance in our world. Uh, and if that's true, then I think uh, we should try to um, created in, in the future rather than just taking solace in the fact that we've humanized the inevitable because it's not always inevitable. Sam, thank you. I didn't, I wasn't expecting uh, your uh, your answers to the other more sort of open-ended questions, but but thank you. Thank you for that. Can, can we just dig a little bit deeper into the nature of the relationship then between, yes. between humanitarianism as, as an attempt to, to, as you say, humanize war, and what people of our generation used to describe or refer to as the military industrial complex, right? Um, what is the nature of that relationship? Is it, I'm sure it isn't singular. I'm sure there are many different um, tones to it, but right. in your research, have you, have you discerned, identified, you know, particularly potentially very worrying sort of interconnections where, where there are organizations academics, authors who are in some way benefiting directly or indirectly from their support for, for the military industrial complex. And if that's the case, what, what do we do with that? Where do we go with that, that kind of Well, fact? yeah, 
It's a it's another excellent question. I guess I I don't think it's as crude as that, or at least I haven't identified that sort of relationship. I will say that if if we're interested in the reasons why Americans fight so many wars, you know, routinely with British sidekicks and so forth, uh, well, you know, humanization recently is you know a a minor causal factor. If, if in the cases where it's relevant at all, uh, and there are big forces, you know, nationalism, uh, s s various kinds of security complexes, and since you've raised it, the the fact that you know people benefit from war, especially when states uh, like mine approach a trillion dollars a year in defense uh, funding. And so all of these are also deserve challenge to the extent we think that you know these wars don't make the world a better place. Um, I, I guess I I thought that the the humanization factor, however small, was worth some attention, just because I think it's it it was understudied. I mean we've people like me have been denouncing the military industrial complex for decades. Um, and there's, there's more to be done there clearly. Um, but I didn't feel that uh, this dilemma of reform and, and, and the, the, the risks it, it, it can run had been given its attention. And then there was just the experience of the Obama administration when his two main speeches on the war on terror, which both of which I mentioned, uh, are are not about the justification, the let's say the real reasons the war on terror continued. First, uh, you know, it 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 was crucial. Uh, I think leading politicians believed after two thousand one never to let something like September 11 happen again. And then there was a need to avoid American body bags. And that is the main reason for the rise of armed drones and special forces. But Obama didn't talk about that. He didn't talk about military Keynesianism and having a budget that uh, is in which there's so little welfare, but so much warfare, uh, ex except, you know, welfare for corporations like Raytheon. Instead, he talked about humanity and the, huma the, the great humanity that he was bringing to American war. And that's just rhetorically interesting. And these rules he imposed, which changed the real war, are really interesting. So um, that's why I focus there. Um, I should mention that, you know, I don't know about you, but my experience of uh, life, you know, being young in the 90s and middle age now is that in my youth, the main arguments that ethicists were making were about the need for force, and particularly American force in a unipolar order when humanity suffers, especially if the, inter the interventions for the sake of humanity were themselves conducted humanely. That was the whole spirit of the 1990s. And I think we can look back and say, there was a, a, there was a false end of history. Uh, and uh, actually it turns out that um, the real problem was that in this unipolar moment, America was romanticized including in its war making and the the legacy of that um mistake after 2001 i think has been tremendous many many people denounced the west's failure to intervene in rwanda right many people denounced the west inadequate um maintenance of the so-called uh, the, the safety zones uh in uh, in bosnia so yeah absolutely there's some fascinating shifts over the last last 20 years or so We've got some questions coming in. Um, let's start with, uh, with with Michael, Michael Freeman, who, who we know we know we know well. Um, so so uh, Michael asks. Michael Warzer has said that if there was ever a just war, World War II was a just war. Do you agree? 
Um, I think there, World War II was a lot of different wars. Um, it, it was a, a British war uh, of survival. And I'm for, you know, self-defense, um, including in the Ukraine case today, although I think we should get into why, you know, thinking about why Vladimir Putin invaded and what he said about Western aggression around the world and the years after 1989 and why it is that we're so concerned about Putin's aggression and not other cases and so forth. So there can be just wars. And I think, you know, uh, Britain has a very strong uh, claim to have fought one uh, in World War II. The American case, I think, is slightly different. Um, first of all, because I think it's widely understood that America provoked Japan to to attack Pearl Harbor. Um, and uh, it, in general, the Pacific War was a contest of, of empires. Um, it was really about imperial control between two bad actors. And I don't see a lot of justice there. And then, of course, it was only Japan's decision to risk war with the United States that led Adolf Hitler, Japan's alliance partner, to declare war on the United States, which he never attacked. Uh, and in turn, the United States entered the war against Germany um, in spite of some help for Britain uh, in prior years, only because Hitler declared war on, on it in, on January, on December 9th, 1941. So in all of that, um, it's very hard to see, let's say, a casus belli that we would say is just clearly just. Now, it's very important to note that there were humanitarian reasons, you know, that involved my Jewish people to in, intervene in World War II for any actor. If we believe in humanitarian intervention, that was that was a, a time for it, but it didn't happen. Uh, neither in the motivation for American entry, um, nor in the conduct of of the war. So. Uh, it's it, it, there could have been an American just war in World War II, but the, but but it's harder to make a case that there was one than a lot of people think. So if but but just to 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 conclude, uh, you know, Michael's question is great, and I don't want to deny the theoretical possibility of just wars. I do want to say there have been a lot fewer than people think. And none in my lifetime, especially judged by their results, which have almost unfailingly made humanity worse off. Just to pick up on that point, Sam, there's a really interesting uh, BBC, it's on the BBC, it's a, a three-part documentary series, I think it's called uh, The US and the Holocaust, um, which is really challenging. It's Ken Burns um, produced uh, piece, it's just challenging through historical, um, uh, historical evidence that right. claim that somehow you know, the Second World War was fundamentally motivated to to uh, to, to punish the, the Nazis, but the Holocaust is far, far more complicated. Yeah, there's, well, there's no, I mean, there's really next to no evidence of that proposition, so. Absolutely. On the contrary, actually, in some, which is the yeah. argument of this particular series, I recommend Of course, of course, that's right, yeah. Uh, we have a question from, from Katia, my colleague Katia. Katia, did you want to unmute yourself and, uh, and yes. over to you? Thank you very much. It's not a question, it's more of a sharing um, an experience that aligns with uh, what uh, Professor Moyen has just uh, talked about. I, would, I wouldn't I would describe myself as a, a very uh, strong IHL scholar, but rather a, a young IHL scholar. And I've always uh, asked myself this question, and thank God I'm not a practicing lawyer and I'm not a military lawyer, so I've never had to be, you know, boots on the ground kind of a person who has to authorize a military hit or not. But I've always asked myself a question, if I were in that position, and I know the law very well, and I can, I can, I can act based on the law and say, yes, it's actually legitimate to authorize this hit and cause this number of collateral damage. And I'm not, I'm not going to be only killing civilians, but also I'll be killing soldiers. And, and that's accepted because that's what the law. But it has never 
ever made me feel okay knowing that the law is on my side and that I'm acting based on the law that this would be still right it's just never sat well with me and going on um I remember I've, I've watched lots of uh ITL films with our students and the, the the point of these films were actually to ask ITL questions and um it made everybody uncomfortable at some point because you see these very humanitarian cases in which um, you have to authorize the hit and kill the child and kill the mother because, you know, that next to that house was this uh, group of uh, suicide bombers that was set to kill everybody else instead. So it seemed like, well, this is the right thing to do. This is the right thing to do. And, and that's, I think, the moral dilemma is that when you're faced with these situations and scenarios, you look at it and you feel like, well, but this is the right thing to do. And what this has left us is with feeling we don't have any other choice. And it kind of uh, makes us feel, yeah, that we justify, we justify um, um, our knowledge of the law and acting based on the law by saying we don't have any other choice. And this is always the lesser evil, the lesser evil, but it kind of deviates uh, from the main argument, which we should be probably arguing for, that this is completely unnecessary to begin with. Um, uh, and, and we should probably be advocating um, uh, to end this kind of aggression rather than to justify it based on law. But as I see it now, um, all, the, all, the, all, all the efforts uh, pour towards um, endless debates within the law itself and how it should be conducted and what we need to be doing now um, uh, in order to reinterpret the law in terms of the new technology that is coming out and space and cyberspace and all these things, but nothing, not much about um, can we reevaluate our approach to wars altogether? Um, it was just something I wanted to share with you because of the no, no other option left feel that we always kind of. All right. Well, no, that that was terrific and, and really compelling. Um, I, I suppose I'll say that first, it's very easy to sit outside government and criticize it uh, and downplay or trivialize the honorable work that actors within it with the right intentions are trying to do, especially when they've concluded that the, the lesser evil dictates that they um, approve, you know, strikes that are, uh, you know, legal under applicable law, um, even when it involves a lot of damage. Now, I, I you know, I, I, I think that there's, there's this question about lawyers inside government, um, because, uh, you know, they, they could, have institutional per professional pressures to you know find the situation of lesser evil more regularly than it actually obtains uh and that goes back to you know andrew's question and and my response to it um i think they're even more subject than the average citizen to the conclusion that there's no alternative but to uh, choose the lesser evil. Uh, and yet, sometimes there is even within government. And I think you can uh, find that actually, lawyers in government are much more likely to disapprove targeting decisions than they are to conclude that the wars, the wars themselves, they've been uh, asked to, uh, you know, find legal uh, are are in fact legal. So there are there are very famous cases from my country where, um, you know, it turns out that lawyers in government have basically become rubber stamps on that question. You know, they've they never find that it would be illegal for a president to initiate a war, um, including under applicable international law. Whereas there there have been instances, indeed many instances, in which lawyers did forbid certain strikes uh, because of you know illegal choice of targets or excessive collateral damage risks or whatever. Um, and I think we have to ask, well, why, why that structure? Um, 
you know, a very famous British case would be in the coming of the Iraq war, when the legal conclusion that it was not uh, allowed was just overridden by other lawyers and eventually by the foreign secretary. Um, and uh, ever since that date, British lawyers have been like American ones, very permissive. Uh, and so we have to ask, you know, why is it that um, actually there is some constraint that lawyers are willing to impose when it comes to the conduct of hostilities, but not when it comes to their initiation or continuation. So anyway, I, th this, this could lead to a lot of um, debates, but you know, my, my own take is that, you know, maybe we have a, a theory of role morality. And of course, lawyers working for government, incurring favor with their superiors, et cetera, et cetera, are going to basically be compliant. Uh, and they make a small difference within a structure of evil, since government is usually evil. Um, and then the question is, do we still want them to inhabit that role and take responsibility on the outside for denouncing, you know, how permissive they are and for attacking politicians and for raising a movement? Because in the end, all of these political figures are just answering to the legitimation space that's created by tons of actors, um, most outside government. So, you know, my own conclusion would would be that we ought to sympathize with the plight of government lawyers. Many of us would never choose to be one because it seems so compromised, but that those who have chosen to authorize evil from within government can soften its blow. And again, that's probably for the best so long as it's not taken to by people outside uh, to validate you know, government ethically, when in fact, there should be immense pressure put on government to change its ways. Sam, thank you. Thank you so much. As, as I said at the very beginning, there are so many layers to, to this project, um, so many implications for so many people um, trying to do to good work, and those involved in the industry of evil too, I'm sure should should be should be reading your book. Thank you so much. Thank you for giving up your time and sharing it with us today. I'd, I'd like to thank obviously the people behind the scenes who have made this possible, Felipe, our new colleague, Amy. Amy, welcome to the Human Rights Center, uh, and Katia as well, and of course the audience who have given up their time. Uh, Sam, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I hope the book turns out to be as, as, uh, as successful as the, as the previous ones and as, as iconoclastic <laughs> as, uh, as the previous ones too. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.